Hello, everybody. Good evening. Welcome to Labla Literary Salon Virtual Edition. Um, I'm very excited to see all of you. Thank you for calling in and joining. Tonight, we have an extra special evening because we have six readers, and they are Jesse Tu, Delia Lasky, Chuck Odello, Michelle Hart, Leslie Tenorio, and Joanna Hershon. Um, so to kick us off, we have Jessie, and an extra special thanks to Jessie because she's calling in all the way from Sydney, Australia to read to us this evening, which is for her 8 a.m. on Sunday morning. So thank you for waking up early on a Sunday and reading to us. Welcome, Jessie. Uh, thank, thank you so much, Paige. Thanks for having this, um, hosting this for everyone. And hi, everyone who's um, listening online and um, greetings to all the other readers. So um, I'm going to hold a picture, I'll hold up my novel for you um, to show you. It's called A Lonely Girl is a Dangerous Thing. And I basically wrote it about two years ago um, because I was trying to find out why a lot of my 20s um, I used as a woman, a single woman in Sydney, I was using um, sex as a way to feel pow power in my own body and validation from men. And I felt that was really conflicting as a feminist. Um, and um, so the book really is, it's not biographical at all, but um, it's um, informed by uh, a lot of the stuff that I went through as a violinist. So it, it picks up as, it picks up at, um, uh, for it picks up at uh, the age of 22 for a young woman. Um, she is trying to, rediscover her power as um, a violinist and um, really just battling with the uh, competing urges she has um, to find out why she does what she does basically. So I'm going to read from chapter two um, and the only thing you guys need to know is that um, her best friend is Olivia uh, and her teacher his name is Banks. Home is Sydney an old terrace house with cracked walls, tasteful damp. I live on a quiet street in Newtown, a suburb in the inner west linked with milk crates, cafes and bike stores owned by bearded white guys with sensible tattoos. Most practice takes place here, away from the chaos of the city, away from my mother and away from banks. A week after the funeral, Olivia and I find an evening to practice together. I'm in bed pushing a glass vibrator between my legs when I hear her arrive. I wipe myself clean and slip on a t-shirt and shorts before opening the door. She wheels her bike onto the veranda as I step out barefoot. Her hair bunched in a loose ponytail, a violin case strapped to her back. But why did you cycle here? It's dangerous on King Street. I say. She shrugs, unties her hair and whips it around like a dog shaking off its wet. She's clutching her helmet in one hand and extracting a Tupperware container from her shoulder bag. I just baked brownies this morning, she said. These don't have hash in them, do they? I ask. I follow her into the kitchen. She pours herself a glass of water. Why would I want us to be stoned while practicing? she asks. We're auditioning for a permanent place in the Sydney Symphony Orchestra. Both of us have been casual since the beginning of 2015, sustaining on sporadic incomes. The audition is a few months away. Only one position is opening. My best friend and I are vying for the same role. It's new terrain for us. The orchestra performs four nights a week, beginning Wednesday. Most of the time we're on court for Friday and Saturday nights. The programs on these nights require larger numbers, Mahler, Brahms, big romantic symphonies. The pay is decent. One concert, one concert is enough to cover a week's rent. I have a small amount of money left from my time as a soloist. Most of it I'd spent on books during university. Did you warm up already? Olivia slips off her case and begins unzipping. Yeah. We play chromatic scales. G, G sharp, A, A flat, all the way to F sharp, then down again. We pick each other apart sonically. Whoever fumbles on intonation has to buy dinner. In the last two weeks, I've had to pick up the bill. 
Olivia thinks I'm deliberately hitting the wrong notes because I pity her. We both know I am the better player. The first five minutes we play flawlessly, two violins in unison. We hit each note with the calibrated position of a sniper. During a fast ascending passage of the F harmonic minor scale, her notes scatter off key. I blast her. She dips her chin in defeat. I can only afford tie, she says. After graduation, Olivia moved in with Noah. They'd met th on, in theatre sport one Tuesday afternoon when Olivia was in year 10 at Barker College. Noah was in year 12 at Newington. They started fucking a few weeks later and haven't spent a weekend apart since. They have shared iTunes playlists containing Coldplay, Maroon 5 and Drake. They once played an entire Bruno Mars album on repeat at a party. I had to leave to find another party, one with better music. Their studio is on the ground floor of an apartment block in Enmore. They tell me they don't mind the forced physical intimacy. Before Olivia, there was nobody else. I was one of those girls people saw coming and going, appearing too busy to socialize. I'd never known how to relax, how to hang out. I had no idea how to be. Recently, Olivia had been the one coming and going. Perhaps it's her job teaching violin at her old primary school in the Blue Mountains. Perhaps it's her mother whose illness she had not yet named. Perhaps even she does not know what it is. We finish the scales, arpeggios, bow exercises and move on to the excerpts. On my laptop, I bring up the third movement of Beethoven's Ninth and we play along. Can we do it separately? Olivia sighs through her nose. What's wrong? You're playing too loud. It's supposed to be loud, fortissimo. I'm hungry. Then order. I'll just stop there. Thank you so much, Jesse. Thank uh, can you. you. I'm really excited to read that. Can you remind us what day it comes out again? Uh, July 2nd. July 2nd, awesome. So that's, I don't know what day that is, but Wednesday, Thursday? I'm yeah. going to post so that everyone is able to order Jesse's book. Sorry, I can't talk and copy and paste at the same time. There we go. I've posted the link for Jesse's book. So please um, click over and support these amazing writers and independent bookstores. Thank you so much, Jesse. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So now I'm going to pass it over to our second reader of the evening, Celia Lasky. Welcome, Celia. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Um, all right, do I just go? <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> all right. Um, so hi, everybody. I'm Celia. Um, my book is Under the Rainbow um, with this deer with the bow tie on it. Um, it came out March 3rd, uh, which was just perfect timing for the pandemic to hit. So that was really fun. Um, and it's funny. It feels like almost years ago now. I barely even think about this book anymore now. Um, but it is about a queer task force that is sent into the most homophobic town in the nation called Big Burr. And um, that's a fictional town in Kansas. And um, it's a novel in stories. So each chapter is written from the point of view of a different character. And some are from the task force and some are from the town. Um, and what I'm going to read to you is um, a townsperson and the task force is in the town for two years and um, this chapter that I'm reading takes place during the second year that the task force is there so um, they've been there for a little while and um, this chapter is Gabe and all you need to know is um, the first line I'm going to read is a message um, that's being sent in the app Grinder. It's hard because you guys can't see, you know, that it's like in italics. So just in case you get confused when I read this first line. Okay. You want to meet at a motel? On my phone screen, the blue speech bubble from PB Tall Guy floats over a dark gray background wallpapered with little grinder logos, a face mask with two round eye holes. 
PB Tall Guy didn't put a question mark after motel. Like he's not asking, but reading my thoughts. I want to meet at a motel. I do. I want to meet at a motel real, real bad. A toilet in the stall next to me flushes. I've been gone five minutes, maybe 10. Jean is out there in Giovanni's dining room, probably watching her chicken piccata get cold, wondering if I'm having diarrhea or if I ran into someone I know. Or she's on Facebook, scrolling past pictures of her cousin's babies and articles about this season of looking for love. She's definitely on her second glass of wine. I close grinder and put my phone in my pocket, sweat slicks my forehead, upper lip, and palms. I wipe it off with a wad of toilet paper, then drop the toilet paper, then drop the paper in the toilet and flush. You okay, Jean says when I come back to the table. She says it flatly, annoyed, not concerned. My stomach is just a little upset. It's not exactly a lie. QB nausea, I used to call it, the kind that would hit before a big game when I was excited but knew so much was riding on it. Again, Jean says, I don't know why you refuse to see Dr. Weber when this is happening every other day. It's not that bad, hon. It's bad enough to ruin our anniversary. We've spent half the night in the bathroom. She looks down at the table, then back at me with glassy eyes. God, I'm the worst. As of today, Jean and I have been married for 15 years. Something about that number has sent me into a tailspin. I guess it's because milestones that are multiples of five always feel weightier, more significant. And 15 years is just a long fucking time. A long fucking time to be pretending. I've been on Grinder for a while now, but mostly just to look. Today, my 15th anniversary is the first time I've considered going through with it. I'm sorry, I say, reaching across the table. Jean keeps her hand limp, refusing to close her fingers around mine. It's not like I can control it. The sound of something shattering comes from the kitchen and everyone in the restaurant turns. At a table in the corner, a man sits across from another man. They have coiffed haircuts and visible pectorals underneath their starched oxfords, one of which is covered in a bright floral print. The man in my sight line regards me with a slightly raised eyebrow and I quickly avert my gaze, keeping the pair in my peripheral vision while trying to pay attention to what Jean is saying. Something about probiotics. The other man turns around in his chair and looks in my direction. Jesus Christ, you're imagining it, I tell myself. You look like every other straight man in this restaurant sitting across from a, wo from a woman. Before the task force arrived, I never had to worry about being spotted or outed, but now everywhere I go, I swear I can feel them looking at me, looking through me, not to mention my online presence. The only grinder people from Big Burr know about is the kind with pepper in it, but I've seen a few task, mem task force members on there. I changed my picture to a generic ab shot and made sure there were no identifying details in my profile, but that makes it harder to catch someone's interest. A lot of guys even say, no face pic, no chat. Dessert, asks Norm, our usual waiter. Jean looks at my plate, the square of lasagna almost fully intact. I don't think so. We split the, the tiramisu every time we come for dinner. Hun, you want some tiramisu, I say. You're not feeling well. We should just go home. She folds her cloth napkin into a neat square. Disappointment hangs on her face. Norm shifts his weight from one foot to the other. We'll take the tiramisu to go, I say. At home, two empty macaroni and cheese boxes and an orange crusted bowl sit on the kitchen counter. The familiar sounds of swords clanging, blood sluicing, and death groans emanate from the living room. Jean tosses her purse on the table and gives me a do something about this look. Billy, I call out. He doesn't answer. I walk into the living room. I'm at the hardest part, he says, his eyes fixed on the TV. A fighter with an octopus head shoots out a tentacle and wraps it around a samurai's neck. The samurai's face turns blue and he collapses to the ground. I pick up the remote from the coffee table and turn the TV off. What the fuck, Dad? Billy turns to me, his eyes rage-filled like one of the characters from his game, and throws the controller across the room. The terrible twos have nothing on a 16-year-old with an addiction to video games and a temper like a buck in the rut. You left the kitchen a mess. I'll pick it up later. 
Now, I say, he blows air out from between his lips. You don't need to take it out on me just because you and mom had a shitty date. I blink. Taxidermies, taxidermied heads of deer, elk, and antelope line the living room walls, trophies from hunting trips I've taken over the years. The white-tailed buck has a smug expression, his mouth curled up at the edges, and his head tilted at a watchful angle. He knows, the deer seems to say. Billy huffs by me, his shoulder knocking against mine on the way into the kitchen. Jean sidesteps Billy and hands me a cup of ginger ale. On the surface, a sweet gesture, but there's resentment behind it. Drink this and shut up about your stomach. Coming to bed, she asks, right after I drink this. As she walks up the stairs, I feel the warm weight of my phone in my pocket. The blue speech bubble drifts somewhere inside of it, lonely, waiting for a response. I lock myself in the downstairs guest bathroom with my cup of ginger ale. In the bathroom is starting to feel more fitting than in the closet, since the only place private enough to check grinder. The room is decked out in Jean's late fall decor, beige hand towels covered in red and orange applique leaves, a clear vase full of dried wheat stalks, and a green and yellow striped gourd next to the soap dispenser. The one non-seasonal item is a far side daily calendar that sits on the toilet tank lid. Every morning, Jean rips off the previous day's comic, even though we almost exclusively use the upstairs bathroom. Today's comic shows two wolves standing in the middle of a flock of sheep holding sheep masks. When you look at the sheep more closely, there are seams connecting their heads to their bodies and fabric patches over their wool coats. The caption says, wait a minute, isn't anyone here a real sheep? Writing back doesn't mean I'm committing to anything. Where and when, I reply. My yellow speech bubble hangs underneath his, the lonely one now. And I think I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Celia. Oh, I love that excerpt that you read. Thank you. Thank the you. Dialogue and the message exchange. <laughs> Does that still count as dialogue? I think kind of, right? Yeah. Thank you. I'm going to post in the chat. Again, I can't talk and talk in the um, The link to Celia's book, so there it is, using Bookshop. Um, thank you so much for sharing that with all of us, Celia. All right, so now I'm going to pass it over to Chuck. Thank you, Paige. Uh, I'm going to read from my novel, uh, The Revolving Heart. So I'll put the uh, cover up there. And just to set the context, I'm going to uh, read a little uh, something from the, the book jacket, and then I'm going to read an excerpt from chapter two. On a beautiful summer morning at the Jersey Shore, four-year-old Sarah Carpenter wanders towards the ocean and never returns. The police think she drowned, but her babysitter Amy claims Sarah was abducted. The only other witness, 17-year-old Donnie Marcino, didn't see a thing. A narcoleptic since birth, he was fast asleep. 20 years later, Sarah's disappearance still haunts Donnie, as does his lingering bond with Amy. When she calls from the hospital after a failed suicide attempt, Donnie returns to his hometown. But how can he help Amy and help himself without changing the past? So that just gives a little context that will hopefully uh, help this make sense. The passage I'm going to read is from chapter two. Uh, the protagonist is heading back to his hometown uh, in New Jersey to visit his old girlfriend. Uh, his current girlfriend, Kelly, is making the trip with him. I'll read one passage. Uh, then I'm going to jump a few pages and read another passage, both from the second chapter. Well, it's complicated, I said. I'm not sure where to begin. Amy and I have known each other since we were five. Was she the first girl you ever kissed? Yes. The first boy I ever kissed is in prison now, Kelly said. Securities fraud. See, you're not the only one with a colorful past. She smiled as if her admission had been scandalous, and I wanted to kiss her pretty knuckles and say, that's not even close. We were on a plane 30,000 miles off the ground where only God and radar could see us, as good a place as any for a man to unravel. If you're not ready, Kelly said, yes, exactly, I'm not ready, I thought, but I was trying to be better than that. It was time to man up, a phrase I hated mostly because I rarely did it. Amy and I used to babysit for this girl named Sarah Carpenter, I said. She was four years old, really smart, absolutely adorable. Her mother was a single parent who had some issues. 
uh, that's a kind description, I guess. Laura Carpenter was a fuck up, not a bad fuck up, just overwhelmed. She was 25, not much older than us really, and had to work three jobs just to make rent. The father, whoever he was, was long gone. It's possible Laura didn't even know who he was. Monogamy wasn't her thing. She was supposed to pay Amy three bucks an hour to look after Sarah, but most weeks she was too broke to settle up, and after a while, Amy watched Sarah for free. Since Amy and I were always together back then, we became a team. What were we gonna do, leave a four-year-old on her own? All true, of course, but not quite true enough. What was missing was the love. Amy and I weren't just babysitters. In the months before Sarah's disappearance, we were practically raising her, buying clothes, fixing her dinner, taking her to doctor appointments. I earned decent money working at my uncle's pizzeria, and whenever Laura fell short, which was nearly every month, I'd make up the difference, whether it was buying groceries, paying the cable bill, or making the copay for one of those doctor visits. People wondered if maybe I was Sarah's father. Why else would a 17-year-old spend his money on a little kid? It might have seemed strange, but I was trying to be a good person, and I knew that Sarah's childhood could easily have been my own. Like Sarah, I had no idea who my birth father was. All I knew was that my mother had dropped out of high school her senior year and moved to New York to become famous. According to Uncle Dan, letters home would arrive sporadically with brief, sometimes cryptic notes about her life. One such letter included a clipping from the Sunday Circular for Sears, my 17-year-old mother posed in her underwear, along with three other girls in a half-page spread, the other half featuring blowout deals on lawnmowers and barbecue grills. Eventually, the letters stopped coming, her final one, nothing but a, the, the handwritten lyrics to Elton John's Goodbye Yellow Brick Road scrawled on the back of a strip club napkin. The most Uncle Dan ever told me about her childhood, his childhood too, was that they'd grown up in an unhappy home. My grandparents died when I was three, and I had no recollection of them, only a single photograph of the three of us taken beside an artificial Christmas tree, the string of lights dim, a star perched crookedly on the top branch. In the photo, I'm lodged in my grandfather's hairy arms, my grandmother looking away from the camera, a bulky black pocketbook resting on her lap, her arms folded as if she were waiting for a bus. Everyone appears pissed, even me my clenched baby face fighting back tears. Maybe mom had a good reason for running away. Eventually she wound up in the punk world in New York City when the scene was at its peak. My birth father could have been any number of punks or speed freaks who had hung out at CBGB or Max's Kansas City. Lucky for me, my mother was clean when she got knocked up and managed to stay that way until I was born. For two months, she tried to raise me in a squatter's loft deep in the Bowery but when some drummer invited her to join him on his band's Midwest tour, my mother packed whatever things she had for me and hitched a ride to her older brother's place in New Jersey. Uncle Dan wasn't home, so mom, anxious to get back to her drummer, left me on the front stoop. Before taking off, she grabbed a pizza box from the trash can next door and placed me on top of it. The cardboard, I suppose, meant to shield me from the damp cement. This was the apex of her maternal instinct. When Uncle Dan came home, he found me crying atop a crushed pizza box from Donatello's pasta and pie. That was how I got my name. My birth name, until Uncle Dan had it legally changed two months before I started kindergarten, was Razor Trip. I've seen the birth certificate, Razor Trip Marcino, father unknown. That was me. What did a single man, a Vietnam vet, trying to escape his demons by opening a pizza joint in a faded town on the Jersey Shore need with a two-month-old colicky baby boy? Not a damn thing. All these years later, it was still hard to believe my uncle hadn't shift me off to social services with a free-to-a-good-home sign pinned to my blanket. But he didn't. I was lucky, and I wanted to make sure that Sarah Carpenter was lucky, too. The flight attendant squeezed down the aisle, handing out peanuts and little plastic cups of water or soda, the cart bumping against my shoulder as it stopped at our row. The bearded guy across the aisle waving his credit card and ordering a Bloody Mary as I snatched our peanuts and handed Kelly her warm ginger ale. The plane hit some turbulence and we leaned back in our seats. I never realized you like children, Kelly said. Was Sarah's mother, uh, Laura, right? Uh, was she at least appreciative? Sometimes, but she took us for granted. Who knows, if we were five years older, she might have given us custody. But she wasn't a bad mother. She loved Sarah, too. 
If I'm giving the opposite impression, that's wrong. She loved her. We all did. It was impossible not to love Sarah. I drank my water and shared some cute Sarah stories, how she had called me duck and liked to decorate my face with the sprinkles from her ice cream cone, how she loved the merry-go-round but would only go on if I rode with her, the two of us straddling a painted pony spinning up and down, Sarah raising her arms and screaming with each revolution, my hands wrapped around her belly so she wouldn't slip. These were good memories, the best ones that I had, provided the memory remained in a two-shot of Sarah and me and excluded Amy, who was sometimes drunk or stoned out of her mind, sprawled on the floor while I put on puppet shows, Sarah giggling her way toward sleep while Amy stared at the ceiling, humming Tori Amos songs and waiting for the room to stop spinning. When I told Kelly that Amy and I were Sarah's babysitters, it wasn't a lie, but it hid the reason why I'd become so involved. Between her junior and senior years, Amy had become unreliable, and I didn't trust her to watch Sarah by herself. I never used words like alcoholic or addict, but back then Amy started her mornings with Cheerios and a joint, and she was never without her silver flask, a hand-me-down from her grandfather, a classic out-of-the-closet drunk who died from a broken liver when Amy was 13. The flask, usually filled with her favorite, peach schnapps, lived in her backpack, stashed behind an old sweater and the sketch pad she carried around to capture her bursts of artistic inspiration. Amy, a master at sneaking sips, able to empty half the flask without my noticing, except when we kissed, her lips creamy sweet, her breath warm and boozy. During sophomore year, she was suspended for a week when three joints were found in her locker. And though she promised she'd never mess up like that again, fortunately, the principal hadn't called the police. I knew her promises were shaky, reinforcing my suspicions that I needed to be around to keep them both safe. And now this jumps to the second passage. Voices from the town, Kathleen R, Davenport Street. The whole thing seems sketchy to me. A four-year-old drowns and they never find the body? Don't tell me it wouldn't have washed up on the shore somewhere. That Sarah was a little sweetheart, but her mother was a real slut. Sorry, I know we're not supposed to judge people anymore, but that's what, sh what she was. And that Marcino kid was always falling asleep and that Amy was a drunk. Who knows what really happened to that poor little girl. The selectivity of what I shared with Kelly dampened any potential relief. The truth chopped up into bite-sized portions, easily swallowed. Yes, I'd fallen asleep, and when I woke up, Sarah was gone. Every rational path concluded that she'd drowned. Amy hadn't been watching and Sarah had waded into the water just a little deeper than she should have. A wave knocked her down, or maybe she stepped on a jellyfish and slipped. Something had happened and the ocean had carried her away. It made perfect tragic sense, but Amy, the only eyewitness, told a different story. All those years later, her exact words, it took her away. I thought she'd meant the ocean, the waves, even a shark, but when she repeated it a few seconds later, her words garbled with sobs, I heard instead, he took her away, a pronoun switch that changed everything. He took her away. It had been hard to hear the waves hissing and popping over the sand, the gulls singing their hungry songs as they swooped around us, a seaplane buzzing in circles with a Kenny's Cove $5 drinks all night banner flapping behind it, its wings. But as Amy looked at me with those sad, hypnotic eyes, I heard those four words more clearly than I'd heard any words spoken before or since. He took her away. I dropped to the sand next to Amy. He, what are you talking about? Where's Sarah? We were close enough to the shore that the tide washed over our feet, the water pooling around our ankles, Sarah's lonely flip-flop drifting in the surf, the surge carrying it back to us as the waves broke against the sand. I picked up the flip-flop and stared at the ocean. He took her away, Amy said, Mr. Ronan. And I'll stop there. Uh, Mr. Ronan is actually uh, their high school teacher. Uh, and uh, that's it. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. I love being left left like that. On um, board, I'm looking for on that cliffhanger to try and figure out what happens next. Thank you so much, Chuck. I'm gonna paste the link here to Chuck's book so that we can all order and find out what exactly happened. Thank you again, Chuck. Thanks. Um, and now I'm gonna pass it over to Michelle Hart. Welcome, Michelle. Hi, thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Um, 
I'm going to read from my novel, which is out sometime next year through Riverhead. It's called We Do What We Do in the Dark. Um, this is sort of unedited, uh, and it's also the first time I've read any of this in public. Um, so here it goes. When Mallory was in college, she had an affair with a woman twice her age. When the woman was 14, she herself had had an affair with a man in his 40s. Mallory admired the woman so much that any similarity between them flattered her. For weeks, Mallory ran on the treadmill behind the woman at the university's gym. It was September of her freshman year. Mallory, whose mother had died months before, had become haunted by the prospect of poor health. Also, she was a first year student and worried about letting something free go to waste. The school's true gym was in the midst of renovations. A crude makeshift workout area now occupied one half of the intramural basketball court. This was separated from the other half by a large mesh curtain. The treadmills and weightlifting equipment were laid atop a foundation of cardboard flooring as to not scuff the hardwood underneath. It was a squalid, airless space, almost like a hospital with nowhere pleasing to look. Mallory felt drawn to the woman the first time she saw her. The woman had walked into the gym wearing a loose fitting tank top so slack it billowed as she moved. She carried an alluring sadness with dark pouches under her eyes that seemed to hold a lot of weariness and wisdom. The woman's facial expression dramatized the, mal the solitude Mallory herself felt inside. She wore it well. And as her shirt ballooned from her body, Mallory saw the woman's melancholy as an invitation, a shared space for the two of them. Tied to the woman's wrist was a small folded towel, and when the woman stepped onto the treadmill, she unwound it, draping it over the machine's control panel so the buttons and the time were hidden. She worked out on her own internal clock. As the woman ran, Mallory looked from the woman's fingernails, painted pastel yellow, to her, to her shoulder blades, which Mallory's mother had called wings, to her ass. The woman had a body that was taut and muscular. It was the kind of body that seemed like it would never be stricken by illness. The woman, Mallory learned, went to the gym at the same time every other day. She ran three miles in 24 minutes. In that period, Mallory could hardly run too, but she found watching the woman made the time heedlessly tick. Seeing how fit the woman was, Mallory began to eat healthier. Instead of a bagel at breakfast, she had a banana or some yogurt. Instead of a sandwich for lunch, she had a salad. By the end of her first month away at school, she burned off most of the baby fat she still carried with her. After 18 years of avoiding her reflection or else being preoccupied by its abject homeliness, she now stood for long surreptitious spells in front of the mirror in the communal bathroom with her shirt hiked up. The university Mallory attended was on Long Island, which didn't seem to her all that different from the New Jersey suburbs in which she grew up. The campus, which was a 45 minute train ride from New York, lay between two towns, one said to be seedy, the other considered posh. The bad part had the bars where some of the students went on weekends since they were within walking distance. The good, which was named Garden City and was hard to get to without a car, had the manicured lawns of professors' homes. The college was a commuter school, and on nights and weekends, it was as if two thirds of the students simply vanished, like the rapture. Lacking both a car and an interest in bars, Mallory felt at once claustrophobic and isolated, a feeling with which she had been familiar for most of her life. She'd hoped college would be different. Her body vibrated with potential energy. But walking to and from her classes, Mallory saw the students and even the campus's buildings as indifferent to her. She had the perpetual feeling of sneezing without being blessed. She wanted to be plucked from the dumb muck of young adulthood. Other than her roommate, whose name was Joy, she hadn't made any new friends. Together, their dorm room was a Janus mask, Joy on one side, misery on the other. Joy had come to the college to study drama. She had the looks and disposition for acting. Many things she did seemed dramatic. When she spoke or ate, she obscured her mouth with the back of her hand. When she read, she sometimes shut the book and bit into its jacket. When she watched shows on her laptop, she blinked rapidly and forcefully, like she was wincing or willing something, like Barbara Eden in I Dream of Jeannie. 
Joy had spent most of her first few weeks at school preparing to audition for the school's play, only to learn that she would not get the part. This had devastated her. For days after her audition, she became withdrawn. During this time, Mallory felt embarrassed on both of their behalves. The, humil the humiliation of a dream deferred was too acute, and Mallory felt incapable of consoling her. A few weeks later, however, Joy declared that the following semester she would study pre-law. Joy's tossing aside an old life brought Mallory comfort. A new one might be waiting for her, too. On a Tuesday night at the end of September, Mallory spoke to the woman for the first time. The university was hosting a visiting writer. Because she was studying literature, Mallory thought she ought to go. Also, she thought she meet, might meet someone new. There were cookies by the entrance of the small auditorium where the visiting writer read. Mallory put one on a clear plastic dish and filled a paper cup with coffee. She sat by herself in the last row. She broke the cookie in half and broke the half in half before sliding it daintily between her lips. As she chewed, she held a hand in front of her mouth, ladylike, the way Joy ate. The woman was sitting in the second row. Her head was bowed as if reading a book in her lap. She wore glasses. Her blonde hair had been pulled loose from the ponytail she wore at the gym and now went down past just her neck. Long bangs fell like fringe across her forehead. Mallory had run on the treadmill behind her so often by then that she could make out the woman from many rows back. An older man, the chair of the English department, called the room to attention. This prompted the woman to look back and survey the room. In doing so, she found Mallory. Mallory looked away, but when she looked back, the eyes were, that woman's eyes were still on her. Mallory fingered the tips of her hair, the way her mother had worried the ends of her wig when meeting someone new. Before she began reading, the visiting writer, who possessed a sort of free-spirited frumpiness that Mallory found, sorry, both envied and found off-putting, told a story about riding the subway weeks earlier. On the train, she had sat across from a man reading a newspaper. He was bald and had bags under his eyes. The newspaper he was reading was from September 11th, 2001. The visiting writer had done a double take to make sure he wasn't hallucinating. The man read the news in a distressed daze as if the disaster had happened the previous day, though it was now seven years later. Watching him made the writer's heart sink. She wondered whether he was a writer himself, a trauma survivor, or a time traveler. Getting off at her stop, she realized these might all be the same thing. Uneasy fragmented laughter broke out in the room. No one knew whether the anecdote was meant as a joke. The visiting writer read from her most recent novel. It was set sometime in the 60s when the Arthur herself had been a child. It involved sexual abuse. As she read, Mallory drifted off. She fantasized about her own future fame, or at least what it might feel like to be seen and revered for her ideas. Hearing all the awards and praise the visiting writer had received made Mallory think writing might be a wonderful career. After the reading was over and after a short Q&A, the woman slid herself from her seat and made for the auditorium's exit. Mallory, feeling bold, fled after her. She followed the woman into the restroom. The woman went into one of the stalls and Mallory stood in front of the wide mirror above the sinks, rocking back and forth on her heels. The woman's urination echoed in the empty restroom. Thinking the woman might be embarrassed by the sound, Mallory turned on the sink, which was automatic. This meant she had to constantly wave her hand underneath to keep the water on. She pumped soap into her hand and washed it off. All vestiges of the soap had been scrubbed away when finally the woman emerged from the stall. Watching the woman move through the mirror, Mallory pulled a paper towel from the ream. She pulled too many though and offered the woman the, woman the surplus. Thank you, the woman said once she was done washing her hands. She spoke with a slight German lilt. What she said sounded more like, thank you. Where are the breath mints, the lotion? Shoot, Mallory said. She patted herself down as if those things might appear. Then they smiled at each other as if they'd been seated on a once turbulent plane, now out of peril. Mallory was charmed and disarmed by the woman standing before her and could not think of anything else to say. 
Fantasies of meeting the woman had occurred so frequently, she found the reality baffling. The woman balled up the paper towel and threw it out. She offered her name and asked Mallory's. Mallory did not like her name, but when the woman repeated it aloud, Mallory Green, it sounded mellifluous, like it belonged in a storybook. The woman pulled open the door. Are you going back in? I don't think I'm going to buy a book, said Mallory, so it seems like I shouldn't. The book is not very good anyway, said the woman. I was more interested in that man on the train. By themselves in the bathroom, in public, but out of view, the woman's scorn gave Mallory a conspiratorial thrill. And I think I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Michelle. Wow, what a fantastic expert. That's so vivid. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Um, and did you say we expect it do you know when it's coming out in 2021? No, we don't know yet. So no, just yeah, you'll, let, you'll let us know though. Yes, so, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> no, that sounds fantastic. Thank you. Um, and so since Michelle does not have a pre-order um, pre link quite yet, um, Michelle has kindly provided, sorry, again, I really need to learn how to talk and copy and paste, provided um, a link for the Oprah project to request donations there as we cannot yet order Michelle's book. And um, Michelle, do you want to say anything about the Oprah project? You're on mute. Should I just read the sentence that I have the one? Uh, trying to flip between, sorry. What did I have here? Um, so the Oprah project is a collective that seeks to address the global crisis faced by black trans people by bringing home cooked, healthy and culturally specific meals and resources to black trans people wherever we can reach them. So please, um, as we cannot yet um, order Michelle's book, please donate to the Oprah project. And thank you again so much, Michelle. Appreciate your reading for us. Thank you. Okay, so now I'm gonna pass it over to Leslie Tenorio. Welcome, Leslie. Hi, can you hear me okay? Perfectly, thank you. Okay, great. Thanks so much, Paige, for doing this. Yeah, it's really generous with your time and effort, and thanks everyone for coming. Uh, I'm gonna read from my novel, which comes out July 7th. It's called The Son of Good Fortune um, from Echo. Uh, it's about a 19-year-old undocumented Filipino kid named Excel who lives in Northern California in a town called Colma. Uh, feeling as though he can't really live a, a real open life in Colma as an undocumented person. He sort of flees with his girlfriend, Sab, to a desert community in Southern California, but an incident occurs where he's forced to return home to Colma um, to uh, repay a debt, and so he needs to go back to Colma to earn money. Um, but he realizes he can't do it on his own and he needs to turn to his mother, Maxima, for help. Maxima is also undocumented and she is a former uh, Filipino B-action movie star slash martial arts expert uh, who is also sort of making ends meet by scamming men online on the internet. Um, so that's their relationship. And um, I'm gonna read a chapter uh, that sort of takes place back in time uh, the morning Excel first left home, uh, first left Colma to go to this desert community um, with his girlfriend, Sab. A dark morning nine months before September. Maxima was leaning against the arm of the couch, hands deep in the pockets of her, pair, of her pink terry cloth robe. Excel was at the front door and down on one knee, tying the laces of his Converse high tops. Triple knot, triple knot, she said, so you don't trip and fall. Double knots enough, he said, but he tripled it anyway, biding his time and what he knew were the last moments before leaving home for good. He had no idea how moments like this were meant to go. He tied one shoe and started tying the other, noticed a tiny tear in the mustard brown carpet, revealing the grain of what looked like dark hard wood. He'd never seen it before, and he felt a sudden urge to rip it further to see what else might be hiding underneath. He got to his feet. Well, he said, guess I'll be going and Maxima moved toward him for what he suspected was a goodbye hug, though neither of them was a hugger. But instead of reaching out to pull him in, she took an envelope from her pocket. Cash, she said, just in case. The gesture caught him off guard. Maxima had been silent for days and pissed off for weeks ever since Excel told her about the job in the desert. It's just a couple months, he said, maybe a little longer. And she said, leaving so soon after Joker? 
But Joker had been dead for a year, which seemed, which seemed enough time to heal, or at least endure. And wasn't that how he was raised? You fall, you get up. Someone hits you, you hit back. Someone dies, you still have to live. He took the envelope, there was a hundred bucks inside, and tucked it in his front pocket. You didn't have to, he said, but thanks. Well, I hope it helps, she said. She retied the sash of her robe so tightly she looked like she was trying to cut off air. Well, he said, slinging his bags over his shoulders, bye. He opened the door and almost stepped through when something slammed so hard against the back of his knee that he dropped to the ground. He tried getting back up but fell back down, his arms suddenly twisted behind his back and Maxima's chin pressing down hard against the top of his skull. If this happens to you, she said, her grip tightening, what do you do? He tried untwisting his arm, getting to his feet, his whole body squirming and stuck. He knew this move, the Maxim attack was what she called it. There were tricks to breaking free from it, but he could never get them right, and by now he'd forgotten them all. Let me go, he said, now. He heard her whisper something, an oracion to keep him down, he assumed, until she finally released his arm and stepped away. She offered a hand to help him up. He refused and stood on his own. Nothing will happen to me, he said, then walked out the door. He hurried through the apartment complex and out the front gate and saw Sab's Corolla parked at the curb. He opened the door, threw in his bags, leaned in to kiss her when he noticed purple streaks in her brown hair. The day before, they'd been blonde. He took a strand and rubbed it between his fingers. Does it look bad, she asked. He shook his head. Looks even better, he said. They kissed, then drove off. And at the final stoplight before getting on the freeway, Excel took out his apartment key and flicked it out the window, the morning still so early and quiet that he heard it clink against the asphalt, the sound of everything he no longer needed. Their destination was a blank on the map. The closest landmark was a city called El Centro and a dot of a town called Wyling near the bottom of California. Once there, they would head east to a place called Hello City. Sab drove. She had the license, the car. Excel's job was to navigate. He unfolded the California roadmap and spread it over his lap, then realized he'd never read an actual map before. When you go nowhere your entire life, nothing is more useless than a map. Their flip phones wouldn't help them if they got lost, so Excel tried making sense of all the grids and lines. Under the dim car light, the whole state looked like an arm bent at the elbow, the crisscrossing freeways like networks to veins. But he finally found San Francisco, then Colma, then the 280 freeway, and finally, maybe, himself. He put a finger on what he estimated was their current position, checking back and forth between the map and the road ahead. He felt like he was tracking his own movement, a kind of out-of-body experience that made him dizzy. His first road trip ever, he didn't want to get carsick, so he put down the map and told Sab it was a straight shot south for a few hours more and reclined in his seat and looked out the window. They passed nothing scenic or memorable, not yet, but he took in every lit up sign for every strip mall, gas station, and fast food chain they passed, like a tourist determined not to miss a single thing. How could he not? Barely an hour outside of Colma, Excel was farther from home than he'd ever been before. Thank you so much. So much, Leslie. So that comes out not this Tuesday, next Tuesday, is that correct? Yes, July 7th. Amazing. So people on this call can still pre order, which we all know is very important. Sorry. There we go. So I have pasted the link. So please make sure you get that now. And then it will be at your house, I imagine, very close to the day it comes out. Thanks so much, Leslie. All Thank right. you. Thank you. So now I'm going to hand it over to Joanna Hershon. Welcome, Joanna. Thank you so much. Um, um, let's see. Can I see myself? <laughs> um, this is my book, St. Ivo. Thank you so much for having us all, Paige. You're amazing. Um, I'm going to, uh, sorry, I'm just going to figure out what's going on. Okay. Um, uh sorry oops okay so um this is my book saint ivo it came out um you know mid pandemic uh which was what it is and um 
Uh, I don't think you need to know. I'm going to read just from page 26 of my novel. I don't think you need to know much. There, it actually starts, it's funny because Michelle's wonderful reading highlighted a man on the subway and um, Sarah, our protagonist, uh, we basically are with her through a um, very unsettling uh, professional lunch. And then she has a very important encounter on a subway with a man. And now she's met her husband in the park and she's remembering something. The summer Lita turned five, Matthew found a garden apartment that shared its outdoor space with neighbors because the fence between the yards had been destroyed during a hurricane. Sarah had just finished shooting the second film, the studio film she was hired to direct, which she already knew was terrible. She wasn't in the greatest mood. They signed a year lease without meeting the neighbors who were away for the month and hoped they, A, wouldn't be crazy, and B, wouldn't mind that Lita rose at 6 a.m., desperate to run outside. Several weeks after Lita had colonized the backyard with her assorted dolls and their accompanying castles and ballet schools and hospitals and movie theaters, the neighbors returned from their trip and introduced themselves that same night with a bottle of limoncello. After learning they'd come from Rome, where Armand had a small part in his first movie, and the two of them had taken the rest of the month to travel. Sarah marveled at how they'd had the energy to be friendly after a transatlantic flight. She would never have managed to be so polite, so social. This was how the friendship took root. Armand and Key were always better behaved. They always led the way. When Armand emerged from the apartment, he was usually fresh from a shower and a shave. He remembered to drag Sarah and Matthew's garbage to the curb if they forgot. And Kiki cooked, but it didn't even seem like she was cooking. What are you making? I don't know, I'm just slicing these sweet potatoes really thinly. What will you do with them? I'm not sure. And they'd be sauteed and served along with exotic greens and cheeses and there'd be bread and wine and Lita would taste everything, eat slowly in a way she rarely did with anyone else. Kiki was a public high school art teacher. Sarah remarked how Kiki's students must, must adore her. She and Armand both played with Lita, not only patiently, but with engagement, and didn't seem to mind the collection of plastic toys inevitably strewn around their cool, childless area of the garden, with its mod thrift store table and chairs and heavy marble ashtray. Sarah had imagined they were interested in having kids one day, but a week into their friendship, Kiki offered up her disinterest in motherhood in the same guileless manner that she prepared meals. Sarah found this disarming and felt a surge of affection for Kiki, a sensation that may have stopped short of sexual attraction, but was easily as primal. Sarah could be, she knew, a bit easy come, easy go about friends, but she recognized that her feelings were not remotely neutral toward this person. Her immediate attachment to Kiki took her by surprise, but she didn't question that Kiki felt the same way. Maybe because of this deep and unfamiliar certainty, Sarah finally stopped apologizing for the mess, for not cooking, for Lita singing at the top of her lungs with tremendous cheer as if she were auditioning for Disney or pretending to be a dog for hours at a time. Sarah stopped insulting her work on the studio film stopped insisting the only reason her first film had been any good was because Matthew had been the DP. She stopped making self-deprecating remarks about how she'd been pregnant at Sundance when her first film premiered, so each photo of her was a fat photo and how she'd been no fun. She stopped making dark jokes about how young she'd been when she found herself pregnant with Lita. She started to relax. One night in late summer, or maybe early fall, they let Lita fall asleep under the table while in character. Good night, doggy. And she slept for three hours. Everything seemed heightened, their laughter more hysterical, as if Armand, Kiki, and Matthew were all daring Sarah to keep having fun. She knew she should have carried Lita up to bed, but the night was warm and Lita was sleeping, wasn't she? What had they laughed so hard about? Which stories had they told? 
September in the city was still her favorite time. The hard shine of the afternoon began easing itself into something softer. The sweat of her schlep to the city and back had dried and disappeared. Families were making their way out of the park and toward the subway, the bus. Some would go away for the weekend. Matthew ran a hand through the thin graying hair she was grateful he still had. She wasn't supposed to care about these things. After all they'd weathered, how could she poss after all they'd weathered, how could she possibly? But she did. She felt a stab of tenderness. But as she began to tell him about Caroline's suggestion that she write a script about it all, she realized too late that she should have kept it to herself. Have you ever? Matthew asked. Have I ever? Have you ever thought about making this your next film? A film about Lita? Yes, about Lita. A film about us. Have you ever thought about it? I know you're not into autobiographical material, but I also know you recognize a good story. I know how your mind works. Do you? Yeah, I do. And I would not be surprised if you thought about writing something, even if you never intended to make it. You're a filmmaker. I don't care if you never make another film. I will always think of you as one. Well, that's dumb, she shrugged, tears brimming, or maybe just sad. Why had she told him? She had no interest in his open-mindedness or his sympathy or disgust at the idea of fictionalizing and likely sensationalizing Lita and their family or least of all, what she realized he was working up to right then, how maybe it was worth considering. I can't believe you think I should do that, she said. I really can't. And just like that, she didn't care about the light or the season or even Matthew. She turned from him and could, in that moment, have walked off forever. She remembered the beginning of their separation with no daily need to maintain a display of hope Something about being alone had been distinctly not sad. With nothing between her, bo her body and the sensation of loss, she realized she'd been protecting him from precisely how dark she'd become. She was relieved to be free from that charade, from him. I'm not saying that, I'm not, slow down. I'm just saying, you're just saying? I'm just saying, has it ever occurred to you that it might even help, help? Yes, help? Help with what exactly? Look, he shook his head. I don't know, it has crossed my mind that it might help. If you could make a film, despite her being too furious to speak, she stared at him, moved by his desperation. Forget it, she nodded. I don't understand why you're so upset. That's clear. It's a suggestion that he stopped himself. What? He shook his head and she waited it out. His expression said that this was her doing, that she was forcing him to say something they'd both feel uncomfortable hearing out loud. Look, I'm surprised she hasn't suggested this before now. She's your agent. It's a suggestion. Doesn't mean you have to, to write the thing. I know that. I know she's my agent. She turned toward the trees. Where are you going? She didn't know. She turned further into the park. They'd been back together over a year now, and the memories she'd held on to from their two-year separation were overwhelmingly the sad ones, marked with shame and regret. The men she'd encountered, they'd been placed inside the narrowest stairwells and smallest bathrooms and corners of her memory palace at the end of a long, dark hallway. It wasn't as if, as if she never walked down that hall and peered inside, but doing so had become depressing. But with the spike of righteous indignation, she remembered it hadn't all been sad. And I will end there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Joanna. Wow, another one. Such great dialogue tonight. I can't believe it. I'm super excited for that book. Thank you so much for reading from it for us. Um, I'm going to post the link here for Joanna's book, St. Ivo. So we all have it here. Um, and thank you again, everybody, for coming and calling in and listening to all these incredible readers tonight. Thank you to Jesse and Celia and Chuck and Michelle and Leslie and Joanna for reading to us. 
Um, we won't be here next Saturday for the American holiday, but we'll be back on the 11th. So um, please keep calling in and supporting all of these amazing readers um, and independent bookstores. Don't forget to buy the book. And thank you again to everybody for reading and calling in. Good night. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Bye.